John chapter 3 and verse 16. And like I said, we're doing a collection of talks called The Other 316. And uh, what we're doing in these talks is we're going to go to John 316, which outlines for us the good news of what Jesus has done for each and every single human being that's ever lived. And then we're going to go to other key chapter 3 and verse 16 verses in the Bible that help us even further understand all that Jesus has done for us. I think the goal every time we get together is to leave thinking more about Jesus than ourselves. Come on, I tell you what. All right. John chapter 3 and verse 16. I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to look. For God so loved the world yes, <laughs> that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Can we read it again? For God so loved the world. You are so loved today. Do you know that? You are, you're not just loved, you are so loved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. I believe that about humanity. Should not perish, but have eternal life. Now go with me to Matthew 3.16. Matthew 3.16. And here we find the baptism of Jesus. And it says, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit, the Spirit of God, descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And going on, verse 17, and behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. i got to read that again. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Will you join me in prayer? Jesus, thank you so much for the moments we share as a community. Um, God, we, we recognize that, that these moments are incredibly average and ordinary, if not for you. We ask you to fill this time and space in this moment that we might see you and encounter you and experience your incredible goodness and grace. We love you so much. I thank you, Father, for joy today. I thank you for peace. I thank you for righteousness, all these things that you've granted us. In Jesus' name, Lord, give Coach Carroll and John Schneider incredible wisdom during the draft. Oh, God, in Jesus' name, amen. That's super important, I'm telling you. Um, I, uh, I had an experience a few nights ago, and um, how, how many married people in the room? Any married people? Okay, the 8.30 is always a strong contingency of married people, and I'm not sure why you like the 8.30, but married people love the 8.30. Maybe it's because you go on this incredible romantic day after the 8.30, right? That's what it is, and you just, you've planned this beautiful day for your spouse, and you're going to Take her out on the town. But um, how many married people have children? Married people that have children. Okay, that's all. Wow, fantastic. Uh, this, is, this is, I think this will go over well. Um, do you remember when your kids were um, very small and they would sometimes interrupt uh, your regularly scheduled program? Specifically, your sleeping program. Do you remember this? And, and, and um, if you're married, you're, you and your spouse, um, it's, it's like who's going to get up and, and service the children? Do you remember this? And so uh, Tuesday night, or, or I should say early Wednesday morning, um, our, our nine-year-old um, comes into the room. It's approximately 2.39 a.m. Like I know that specifically, you know. And she comes in, and I, 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 I'm not proud of what I'm going to tell you, but it's honest. I'm not proud of this. Um, but I laid very, very still. <laughs> and I breathed very, very, very lightly and slowly. And I rolled over and I pretended I was completely asleep. Because that's the key. If, if you don't want to help the kids, you got to act like you are the person who's completely asleep. <laughs> and um, this is starting to not go so well. But um, I thought this would be funnier. And now some of you are looking at me like, are you, are you for real, man? 
and you're the pastor here? <laughs> well, you know what? We could talk about your sins too. But um, I, I did. I laid so still. And Grace, our, our little girl, our nine-year-old comes in. She goes, Mom, Mom. And I, I love this. I don't know how in the providence of God this worked out. But um, every single home we've been in or town home we've lived in, Chelsea's side of the bed, we have a side of the bed, I'm sure you do too, like we all, I always sleep on what is to me the right side of the bed, she sleeps on the left side of the bed, her side has always been closest to the door, by the grace of God, and so, great, and so the kids always walk in and go straight to mom, I mean, tell me there is not a God and he loves me, so she comes in, she's like, mom, mom, and I hear, and I'm like, <laughs> she's like, Elliot's not feeling good. And I, I know, it's terrible. I should be like, I should jump up and be like, he's not feeling good? I will pray over him. We'll take communion, you know. But I just rolled over and pretended to be asleep. And so Chelsea gets up and checks on our son and, and I don't know, probably 4 a.m., um, Gracie comes back to report. She's, she's so that in like the birth order, she's the reporter. She's always here to tell on her brothers. Always, okay? And so she goes back at 4 a.m. and I, I attempt to do the same thing. But I didn't roll over f like fast enough and lay still enough. And so I rolled over and Chelsea's like, are you awake? <laughs> and at that point I had a really, I had a moral like dilemma. Because I was like, do I, like it's one thing to pretend you're asleep and like get away with it. It's one thing to like be asked if you're asleep. And you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I mean, I have standards. And so I was like, um, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and so anyways, she got me to, to wake up. And um, so I go, I, go, I go check on my son. And, and um, you know, I, I wish, you know, I, I think I did pray for him at some point or something like that. Um, but he's like on his iPad. And I'm like, hey, buddy, how you feeling? He's like, not good. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but you're totally like the same person as me. And so like I kind of know what you're doing. Um, but I don't say that, you know, because I'm like a compassionate father. I'm like, okay. Well, he's like, can I watch my iPad? And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And then he's like, thanks, Dad. I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> I think I, what? And I'm too tired. So I go back to sleep and we wake up the next morning and everything, you know, works out. And and, and I'm laying there in the morning and I'm like, the truth is, my, my wife is such a saint. She really is an angel. And I started to think, how many times have I done the old fake like I'm asleep routine? And I started to almost get a tally in, in my brain. And I don't need to, if there's you know, spouses here, please don't, you don't have to apply this to your own life. I'm sure it's all fair. You guys are all, in, in, both are incredible with your children. But like when it comes to our family, I think about like who gets up at night, who helps the kids, um, who raises them, you know, stuff like that. And, and it's like 9,000 to like 20 when I think of the nights. Chelsea gets up 9,327 times is what I counted. And I'm like a solid uh, 24. But the point is, um, she's a saint. Like, and you know, if, if you're like us, there's kind of, you know, you're supposed to take turns at night, you know, like one spouse gets up and then you get up and they get up and then you get up. But, but honestly, Chelsea is, I can't even fathom how many times I've gotten up in the morning and she's like, and I might have known that maybe she had gotten up with the kids. And the next morning I'll be like, babe, why didn't you wake me up? And she'll be like, oh, you were sleeping so soundly. And like, that, I've never said that to her ever on any night. I'm like, oh, you were sleeping so soundly. I'm always like, babe, babe. <laughs> but she seems to always take my place. Now, this may seem funny to you, but I was literally preparing um, this sermon. And I'm thinking, how many times Chelsea has done what I should have done in our family, particularly late at night. When you're exhausted, when you're tired, there's Chelsea again, being the saint, being the angel. I mean, I married way up. Can I get an amen? Gentlemen, that was an opportunity missed. Let me be clear. That should have been amen throughout the auditorium. So I married up. Can I hear an amen? Uh, too late now. But... Um, 
<laughs> Just thinking about how amazing my wife is and how many times she's done for me what I frankly should have done. And I know this may sound kind of, I don't know, trite and silly, but it got me thinking about this sermon today and thinking about Jesus. For many of us in this room that follow Jesus and worship Jesus and love Jesus, we're here today celebrating the fact that he did for us what we should have done but couldn't do. Jesus took our place. That's actually the the foundational basis of why many of us are here today. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it's got to be my favorite verse in, the, in all of Scripture, that he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The whole story of Jesus is became and become. He became sin so that we might become right with God. He took our place. He did for us what we should have done, but we could not do for ourselves, and that is pay for our sin, our wrong, our error in full. So now we have a shot. We have an opportunity. We have a chance at having a right relationship with the one who designed us and created us. Jesus, Jesus, we're here today celebrating that he took our place. Can I say it this way? I'm, I'm excited for the band to come back in a few minutes and sing songs to Jesus because I choose to let Jesus pay for my sins. As crazy as that sounds, and it almost sounds scandalous, and frankly, I think it might be, but I choose, I'm going to say it again, I choose to let Jesus pay for my sins. I'm going to say it again. I choose to let Jesus pay for my sins for my sins. <laughs> it's amazing. I, I, it, 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 it's hard to believe. It almost sounds too good to be true, but I choose to let Jesus pay for my sins. I could pay for my sins. The Bible says there will be a judgment day for those who, who have ever lived on planet earth. There will be a judgment day, a reckoning for our error, our wrong, and our sin and we need a hero, if not a hero, we have to pay for our own wrong, our own error, our own sin. But Jesus, who knew no sin because he did not sin, yet he was tempted in all ways that we were tempted because he did not know sin and he did not sin, he could pay for your sin and he could pay for my sin. And the Bible says he became sin so that you and I, by simply receiving his once and for all sacrifice, can become right with God. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what you're going through. But I got a hunch that no matter how difficult and challenging it is, you can find some supernatural joy in the fact today if you simply believe in Jesus and receive his once and for all sacrifice, your error and your wrong and your sin can be, can be forgiven and forgotten forever. And that is incredible. You know, we've been approaching this series with the concept that we live in an unstable world. Part of my passion in expressing the other 316 and going to these extraordinary verses that unpack for us the gospel is that we're living in such uncertain and unstable times. The question is begging to be asked, where do you get your stability? Where do you get your confidence? Where do you get your peace? Where do you get your joy? Is it all circumstantial? Is our whole life dictated by the conditions of our circumstances? Or can we live a transcendent life? Can we live a life that is by nature supernatural? Can we find righteousness, peace, and joy beyond our paycheck, beyond our circumstance, beyond how we feel, beyond how the kids are doing? Can we, can we find that peace and that joy? Today, I'm so excited to share this message with you because if I'm completely candid and honest, the only lasting peace, the only enduring confidence that I've found in this life comes from what I'm about to share with you. 
and I've been through some seasons. I'm staring October, I will turn 40. I know it's shocking to you, and it is to me. <laughs> Be quiet. But four decades now that I've had the privilege of living on this planet, and I've had some seasons. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Have you had like, you know, there's, there's season, and then there's seasons. You know what I'm talking about? Like, there's days you're like, I'm going to go to church. And there's days like, I'm going to go to church. You know, there's days like, man, I, I, I hope there's a good message today in church. It's going to be a good day. I need a word from God. You know, there's, there's a difference. And I've been through a few seasons. And those seasons, the only way that I have made it through with some sanity and some confidence and some assurance is what I'm about to share with you today. Like anybody else, I, I fully admit that um, I am a really, really great person when things are going great. Um, I don't mean to brag, but when conditions are perfect, I am a great human. I'll be honest with you. Like, I'm on the golf course and, like, making a few birdies and pars. I, am, I have such a good attitude. It is amazing. And I'm so kind to who I'm playing with. But throw in a few bogeys. Some of you are like, what's a bogey? That's sad to me. But when things don't go well, it's amazing how my demeanor and attitude can change. So what, what are we going to do? Because I don't know if you've noticed, things are not going so well. There is a lot of pain on this planet. There's a lot of division. There's a lot of hate. There's a lot of injustice. There's a lot of confusing things. How are we going to remain confident, secure, full of peace and joy? It's funny because maybe you're like me and you, you think you can control life. And then something happens and it, you are suddenly reminded you are not in control. Where are you going to find your security, your confidence, and your peace? I'm telling you today, this is where I have discovered enduring, transcendent, lasting peace and confidence and security in this life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, whoever, whenever, wherever, whoever, whoever believes or receives him will not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. It is this verse that encompasses for us what Jesus has done for us. This verse begins to tell us that Jesus died so that we can live. Jesus took our penalty so we could take his blessing. Jesus took our judgment so we could receive his righteousness. Jesus took our place. First John Chapter 4, I believe it is, and I think it's verse 7, says, By this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment be, be, because, look at this, because as he is, as he is, present tense, so also are we in this world. Do we have that in the, in the message, guys? L look at this. Our standing, right after the dash, our standing in the world. You see that? Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. If you simply believe in Jesus and receive his once and for all sacrifice, your standing with God in this world according to the Father is identical with Jesus. You are fully and completely and entirely and eternally Right with God. And you cannot be unright. When you are right with God, it is permanent and it is eternal. Oh, we got something to sing about. We got something to talk about. We got something to rejoice about and clap about. 
The fact is, Jesus took our place, we take his place. There was a switch by simply believe, and now I am right with God forever and ever without end. Wow. The scripture says in another way, you are hidden in Jesus. You're hidden in Christ, which is to say when God sees you, all he sees is Jesus. You are righteous. You are pleasing. You are accepted. You are loved. You are blessed. And God only smiles at you. Why? Because you earned it. Because you deserved it. Because you're educated. Because you, 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 you've been exposed to all things religious. and No, because you simply received the sacrifice of Jesus. That's what we're, I choose to let Jesus pay for my sins. I sent that in a text recently to a friend. I know it sounds funny, it was early in the morning and we were talking and I said, I said, I, I choose to let Jesus pay for my sins and I'm telling you, tears started coming down my eyes as I text that. I was in bed, you know, just Chelsea was still asleep, of course, and I was up early just ministering to people, but that's not the point. <laughs> it's not important. But as I'm laying there, I'm like, oh my word, yeah. You ever said something, you're like, that is so good. And then I text that, and I'm like, I choose to let Jesus pay for my sins. And I just, I'm overwhelmed. I'm laying there, and I'm like, Jesus, thank you. I, you took my place. You took my penalty. You took my judgment. You took my shame. You took my guilt. You took my condemnation. You took it all. And today, I get to live free. For the Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Can I hear an amen? So, of course, when we go to Matthew 3.16, we are told in Scripture, how many know Scripture interprets Scripture? That's very important. Scripture interprets Scripture. So you don't isolate one verse. You keep the verse in the context of the whole story, and that verse will be interpreted by all the other verses. And so the other verses tell us he took our place. So when we see the baptism of Jesus, we are supposed to understand that we too are involved. That when we see Jesus, we ought to also recognize that that is true of us. For instance, Jesus does not need to be baptized the same way we need to be baptized. The Bible says water baptism is a beautiful thing. And by the way, we had 101 people baptized, water baptized here at church on Easter Sunday. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. Incredible. And of course, water baptism is the, the public identification with Jesus that as we go under the water, we're saying our old life, our sins, our air, our wrong is dead. It's under the water and we're coming up brand new. Now, why was Jesus baptized? For he had no sin. He was baptized as an example to you and to me. Number one, that we too should be water baptized. But number two, what was to happen to Jesus in Matthew 3.16 is what also happens to us. And the Bible says, I, I love this portion of scripture and I find it a bit interesting that there's no actual details of how Jesus was dunked. We know he was fully immersed. We know John the Baptist was like, no, I shouldn't baptize you. You should baptize me. And Jesus says, let it be done as an example. And so we're not told, you know, if, if, if John did it, you know, really fast or slow. or we, we, we don't know. But Jesus certainly goes down under the water. And when he comes up out of the water, it says, behold, number one, that the heavens were open to him. The heavens were open to him. And today... I'd like to take this little verse and give you three observations that I can honestly say have transformed my everyday life, completely changed my everyday life. I'm not talking about what makes a good sermon on Sunday. I'm talking about what will get you through a Monday. It says, number one, the heavens were open to him. And I say something to you today, if you have believed in Jesus, if you have received Jesus as, as Lord, as God, as Savior, Messiah, and Deliverer, what is true of Jesus is true of you. The heavens are open to you. 
and the heavens were opened. Oh, there's so much symbolism. There's so much to be said of an open heaven in to Israel, Old Testament, New Testament, and open heaven was symbolic, of course, of blessing. It was symbolic of access. It was symbolic of favor. It was symbolic of the fact that God was listening and attentive and involved in your life. The Bible says, and the heavens were open. You ever felt like the heavens were closed? Like your prayers hit the ceiling and hit you right back in your head? You're like, why, why do I feel like that prayer went nowhere? I'm here to tell you, Jesus came up from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him. If you believe in Jesus, I want to make a declaration. The heavens are open to you. You hear me? The heavens are open to you. I'm not speaking directly to maybe some of your feelings or your circumstance or some of the environment that you've experienced. And, and sometimes I am here to declare I have been there where it's like my prayers, they can't be traveling like a foot. I mean, they can't be going anywhere. When I pray, I feel like I'm talking to myself. But the Bible says that for Jesus, the heavens were open. So when I am hidden in Christ, when I am in Jesus, by simply believing and receiving him, guess what? I know the heavens are open to me. God is not far from you. God is near. God is listening. God is attentive. You have access. You have favor and you have blessing. The heavens are open to you. What have you been talking to God about? What have you been praying about? What have you not prayed about and not talked to God about because you didn't believe that maybe he was listening or he was hearing? I'm telling you, God is listening. God is hearing. You keep talking. You have favor. You have access. You are blessed. The blessing of God that maketh rich and add no sorrow to it is upon your life. The heavens, the heavens, the heavens are open. I don't have to earn it or deserve it. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to sweat for it. The heavens are open because Jesus opened the heavens for me and for my family and over my life. The heavens are open over your life. That's in the Bible. Wow. That alone could get you through a day. That alone could get you through a season. You keep telling yourself, and if you need to, you get up tomorrow morning and you look at yourself in the mirror and you tell yourself, the heavens are open to me. That is a biblical fact. That is good theology because I'm hidden in Christ and what is true of Jesus is true of me. And the heavens were open to him. And I love this part, number two, he saw the spirit of God. Descending like a dove. Do you know there's a whole group of people that debate if it was like a dove or if it was a dove. It's the truth. You, you should check it out. There's a whole group of people that like are, are, are continually in conversation and debating whether or not it was a real dove or it was a mechanical dove. <laughs> or, you know, like a dove. And, and, and I, I, I think that the, the point is it's the spirit of God. Or the spirit of Jesus. Heavens are open and the spirit of God is upon Jesus as an example to all who will follow him. One scholar said this, Jesus could not do what he did without the Holy Spirit. Which is to say, yes, he's fully God, but he was also fully man and he needed the energy and the strength and the empowerment of the spirit of God. I'm here to tell you not only are the heavens open, but if you simply believe and receive Jesus, the spirit of Jesus is upon you and within you, energizing you and strengthening you and enabling you, taking you from a religious have to to a spirit energized get to and want to. This life of following Jesus cannot always be I have to, I have to, I have to. It's what's right, it's what's right, it's what's right. No, the Bible says he will take his commandments and write them on my heart and I will have a desire and a passion to do what is right and holy I will want to follow Jesus. Why? Because the spirit of Jesus is upon me and is within me. When I walk on this stage, 
My secret sauce is not public speaking 101. I am not preparing when I walk on this stage for like, well, okay, a smile, square your shoulders, be nice, connect with people, look people in the eye. No, the secret sauce is always the Spirit is upon me. Jesus said it when he was in church. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he's anointed me to preach, to declare. Right? It's the Spirit of Jesus that is upon us and within us that energizes and enables us to do what we are gifted to do by God. And so you go into that board meeting tomorrow and you say, hey, the spirit, you don't have to tell all your partners that the spirit of Jesus is upon you. That might be slightly creepy, but we believe it. And I, I love this passage because um, the spirit of Jesus is, comes in the form of a dove. And that's not on accident. God wasn't randomly like strolling through all the animals. Elephant, rhinoceros, <laughs> click, dove, send them. You know, like, a dove is very symbolic in Scripture. It was symbolic of purity and innocence. I'm here to tell you when the Spirit of Jesus is upon your life and in your life, he'll restore purity and innocence in your life. If you're here today and you're struggling from shame and guilt and your past performance and your past behavior and your old life, I'm here to tell you the beauty of Jesus, the majesty of Jesus, the goodness of Jesus is he will restore an innocence and a purity in your life. I'm telling you, you can, you can be transformed as a person. You will not be defined by who you used to be or what you did last night. Jesus can do a brand new work in your life by his spirit. And I, I love the imagery because it says in the spirit that the dove rested on him. Rested on him. Which is so indicative of the nature and work of the spirit of Jesus in our life. It comes with just a subtle just resting. And, and I'm just going to say this. I'm going to be honest with you. As the pastor of this community, when it comes to the spirit of Jesus, he oftentimes works in your life with a subtle nudge. Just like, a, like, like if a dove just gently rested on your shoulder and there's just this nudge. And I'm telling you, you'll get better at sensing the nudge as you, get, as you just keep following Jesus. And the spirit of Jesus is in your life. You'll just all of a sudden you'll be like, I think maybe. And maybe the caricature of the little demon and the little angel is semi-right. But you get that little nudge from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, do that. No, 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 you don't want to do that. Don't make, don't say that. Nah. Let, let's edit that. Let's filter that. I know you're at Starbucks with a friend and you're talking, but let's not say that because that's gossip. So we're not going to say. And I'm telling you the little nudge. And over the years, I'm telling you the nudge has saved me. Just that little, the resting of the spirit of Jesus. No, 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 no. Say this. I'm telling you, you got a job interview tomorrow? Why don't you trust the nudge of the Spirit of Jesus. And I know it may sound, you know, silly and I'm being funny, but I think there's times in our life it's like, well, that was the dove. The dove is working in my life. You know, and, and, and sometimes we, we, you know, we wish it was just a big old elephant. It's like, I need a big old elephant to run me over, you know. But it's, it's the work of the Spirit of Jesus, like a dove, and it's like, you know, and boy, I have ignored that nudge so many times. Can I just say that? I'll be the first person in line to say, all those who have ignored the nudge of the Spirit of Jesus, line up. I'm first in line. I have ignored it, mostly on the golf course, but I have ignored it. <laughs> right? But he's so gracious. He's so faithful. He's so good. And I've learned to lean on the nudge of the Spirit of Jesus. He is upon you. He is within you, enabling you. That's why socially we're supposed to be different. That's why relationally we're supposed to be different. That's why when we go over to each other's homes, we're, our demeanor is supposed to be different. Our countenance is supposed to be different. Our words are supposed to be different. Why? Because we have the advantage of Jesus living on the inside. 
Jesus enabling us. So when we're at a dinner table having a good time with friends, we talk different, we think different because the Holy Spirit, Spirit of Jesus, is nudging us and guiding us and leading. And that's why of all people on the planet, we should be the people that people are like, whoa, I need to be your friend. You are kind, you are gentle, you are considerate, and frankly, you're a good listener. Well, of course we are because we got the dove, the Spirit of Jesus working in our life. And that ought to be who we are. I just don't see that the spirit of Jesus in our life makes us judgmental, makes us condemning, makes us shameful. I don't think the dove in your life makes you opinionated. I don't think that comes from Jesus at all. I don't think the demeanor of you going over to a friend's house and say, well, I just believe that, you know, bless God, hallelujah, amen. I believe that things need to be right in this country. Thing need, and I, you, you know, I, you, 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 I. Doesn't sound like a dove at all. That demeanor is not anything like a dove at all. More like a like a hawk. God bless them. But our, you, you know, I mean, you got to look at passages like this and go, like a dove. Why a dove? Oh, I think we're supposed to kind of be like that. Oh, 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 we're not weak but we're strength under control. We're meek, not weak. That's who God's called us to be. And lastly, I know I'm cheating because we're going into verse 17. It's supposed to be 316, I know. But the Bible says he, the heavens were open to Jesus. The spirit of Jesus descended on him like a dove. And then the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You know who those words are for? Not for Jesus, really. You think Jesus didn't know that? You think Jesus didn't feel that? Why the audible voice? Because they're for all the onlookers. And all that voice is for all the onlookers and all the listeners. And now, recorded for all time, it's for you and for me. For if you simply believe in Jesus and receive the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus, you instantaneously become the beloved child of God in whom he is. I love this because John 3.16 doesn't just say we're loved. It says so loved, so loved. And Matthew 3.16 doesn't just say pleasing or Matthew 3.17 doesn't just say pleasing. It says well pleasing. You're not just pleasing, you are completely pleasing. You know, every day of my life, no matter what I've done, because it's what he's done. It's not based on my performance. It's based on the finished work of Jesus. For Jesus said, it is finished while on the cross. What's finished? The once and for all sacrifice for my error, my wrong, and my sin. Kylie's now playing softly on the piano to make this incredibly spiritual. Thank you, Kylie. Stay away from boys. But do you know today that if you believe in Jesus, you're well-pleasing? I, I purposely didn't ask you, <clears throat> how you doing? How you feeling? Because no matter how you're doing <clears throat> or how you're feeling, you're well-pleasing. You're well-pleasing. It's amazing to me. How oftentimes we, we fight to trust God for a miracle. God, I need a breakthrough. God, I need you to supernaturally supply financially for my family. And we'll exercise our faith for so many things in this life. But sometimes we forget the most important, and that is to fight to believe that you, the good fight, fight the good fight of faith, that you are well-pleasing. You're well-pleasing. God's countenance towards you cannot change. Did you know that? It can't. For if you're hidden in Christ, his countenance towards Jesus is always well-pleased. So who are you? Do you believe in Jesus? Have you received Jesus? Well, then you're well-pleasing. Did you know that? You are, by definition, the heavens are open to you. 
The heavens are open for you. The spirit of Jesus is upon you and in you. And the countenance of the Father is. <laughs> I love. Beloved. It means chosen. The word beloved means he, he chose you. He chose you. He chose you. I think one of the most beautiful things in the human experience is adoption. And do you know what the Bible says about you and me when it comes to God the Father? That he adopted us. Our three children, they, they came out and we were stuck with each other. You know, it's like, well, you're mine, I'm your, hey, it's providence. But adoption is when a family chooses a child. Out of all the kids, and I've done this, my parents did this to me, I'd do it to my 13-year-old, my 11-year-old, my 9-year-old, if I lined up all the little girls in the world, Gracie, and God said you get to choose one, I would choose you in the top five. No, you know, I, I, I tell her every time, I choose you. Why? The power of choice. That if I got an option, you're the one I choose. Beloved means he chose you. He chose you. He had options, but he chose you. You are beloved. You are, the word beloved also means, in the message Bible says, you're chosen and you're marked by my love. My babies will be here probably at the 1030 service because they're sleeping right now, but that's fine. It's, it's dad will carry the spiritual weight in the family. But they're marked by my love. You say, what do you mean? I provide for them. I take care of them. You're marked by his love. And do you know what well-pleasing in the Message Bible it says, delight of my life. Delight of my life. Are you one of those parents? Did you have one of those parents? Have you heard about one of those parents who on the side of the soccer game or the t-ball game or the flag football game goes nuts? Do you know, do you know, those, you know those parents, right? It, growing up, I didn't know. I thought every dad was like this. And so my dad would be assistant coach or help or be involved. And I'd be like, and eventually I was like, dad, please, just don't, dad, come on, come on. And then, and then, and then I grew up and had friends who said I'd give anything to have a dad like that. And I thank God for my father and my mother because they gave me just a little glimpse of my heavenly father who is on the proverbial sideline of your life, if you will. And guess what? He's that dad. Whose dad is that? That's my dad. Bro, he is wild. I know he really loves me, I guess. I mean, you, 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 you just break for a run down the sideline, and you, he's that dad. Keep running! He's like, Dad, I'm playing. You're not playing. We're going together! I'm like, Dad, you can't run on the field and grab me in the end zone. Yes, I can. I'm your father! I literally had my, my 13 year olds like, Dad, please don't yell during the games. And I'm like, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> I made you. So, right, like, that's your dad. He loves you. I, it may sound odd, but he bottles your tears. He remembers every time you cry. He remembers every time you laugh. He's obsessed with you. That's God. You're the delight of his life. I just got to tell you today, you're the delight of his life. And when you hurt, he hurts. When you hurt, he hurts. When you laugh, he laughs. He Loves you. How much? So loved. How pleasing is he? Well pleasing. You know, oftentimes, and I, I'm ending right here. Kylie has been playing for quite some time. And the band can join me um, whenever they want backstage. But, you know, over the years, Christians have, you know, attended churches, and it's like, man, I, dude, I, I think, you know, we, John 3.16 is great and everything, and it's, it, it's wonderful, but you know, we, we all know that. Can I be the one pastor in your life going, do we? We know that? Do we really? Do we really know how loved we are? Have we accepted it? 
Have we digested it? Have we embraced it? I'd like to suggest not really. And so that's why these sermons are dedicated to the other 316, kind of to prove that we don't totally maybe always accept the original 316. That God so loved you. Let's just talk about you for a second. That he gave his only begotten son that if you would simply believe, you would not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, how he loves you. And he loves you so much. And to me, whatever happens outside these doors, which I know I cannot control, whatever may come, am I the only one? I will not be on my phone for an hour only to pick it up and get news notification of another catastrophe in the world. And every once in a while, I pick up that phone and I go, I just can't handle anymore. It's too much, God. When are you going to fix? This is insane. More pain, more murder, more hate, more God. What is going to give us the strength and stability and confidence and assurance in this life? Because I don't know if you've noticed, this planet needs some people with some confidence and some peace and some assurance and some joy that is enduring and transcendent and goes beyond circumstances. And I got a hunch we ought to be those people. We ought to be those people that walk the streets differently, that stand by the water cooler differently because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and what he's done for us is eternal. Woo, man, I feel like preaching a whole nother sermon. But I'm done because you came to the 830 so you could have the rest of your day. Oh, you're so loved. And we pray, Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. We're so loved. Thank you, God, for an open heaven. Thank you for your spirit that is upon us and within us. And thank you that we are loved and we are well pleasing. God, we're overwhelmed today. This and this alone will give us an enduring stance and approach and perspective to this life that is so unstable. We love you, God. If you're here today and you say, Judah, I'd like to become a follower of Jesus. As we read today, whoever believes or receives him will not perish but have everlasting life. If you would like to receive Receive, that's all it is. It's a gift, receive. You don't earn it, you don't deserve it, you just receive it. If you'd like to receive the gift of Jesus, it can happen in one simple moment. I believe that God has given us a free will, and you can exercise that free will to receive the gift of Jesus. If you'd like to receive his forgiveness and begin the lifelong and eternal journey of loving him and following him, you can do that right now. And I'm going to ask on the count of three, if you'd like to receive Jesus, that you lift up your hand and put it right back down. I believe you know who you are. You're not here by accident. God loves you so much. I ask people to raise their hands when we get together in our community because I believe when you respond on the outside to what's happening on the inside, it becomes all the more real to you personally, to you personally. So you know who you are. One, God loves you. Two, I actually believe you'll never be the same. Three, if that's you, would you just shoot up your hand all over the auditorium and say, that's me. I, I, I believe and I receive. God, I thank you for every single hand raised in this auditorium. I thank you for forgiveness. I thank you, God, for transformation. I thank you, Lord, for new beginnings. I thank you for a new opportunity, a new start. God, a new life in you, in Jesus' name. And secondly, if you're here today and you say, Judah, I'm willing to admit, I I rarely give a second call, but I just feel compelled today. You say, Judah, I, I've been really focused on myself. I, I, I love God, but I've been thinking about myself, focused on myself, my own performance. And today I realize my focus is to be on Jesus. I want to be more preoccupied with Jesus. I want to be more focused on Jesus. I want to think about Jesus. And I'm telling you, that's where the power is. That's where the strength is. 
That's where the peace is. That's where the grace is. It's in Jesus. And if you're willing to admit today, I want to leave here focusing on Jesus, not so much on myself. If that's you, would you raise your hand in the building and say, man, that's me. God, we determine again at church home, this is about Jesus. At church home, the pastor is Jesus. The focus is Jesus. The main theme is Jesus. The focal point is Jesus. We love you, Jesus. In you, we live, move, and have our being. You are the strength of our life. You are the source of our life. You are the joy of our life. You are the peace of our life. You are the sustainability. You are the strength. You are everything we need. And our confidence is in you. Our strength is in you. We love you, Jesus, and we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So do you love our YouTube channel? Does it remind you of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? I knew it, right? Okay, maybe not totally, but if you love it, you could subscribe right here, and we can just keep hanging out. And we're going to have new content like every week, so subscribe right here if you love it. Press it. Click it. Now, subscribe. I miss you. We want to hang out more.